I'd like to invite our panel to join us, please. Terrific. Well, hello, panel, and hello, everybody. My name is Susan Goldberg, and uh, I'm a professor of practice and a vice dean at Arizona State University. I've got an appointment to the journalism school and to the environmental school, and we'd like to welcome you to Cronkite Live. This is a wonderful event tonight in honor of National Hispanic Heritage Month. And we have got a terrific panel um, with three really successful journalists. They're all based here in Washington. And we're gonna talk about their careers and how they made it and their challenges and their successes and anything else that you wanna talk about. So I would like to invite folks to send questions as we go along to the Q&A. So we'll talk for about half an hour and then I'd love to spend the last say 15 minutes answering questions or asking questions from, from the audience. So let me just briefly introduce the panel and then we can, we can just hop right in. So first I wanna introduce Dax Tahara. Dax is executive producer of This Week with George Stephanopoulos and he's been doing that since 2020. He previously was a producer and editor with NBC. He went to Dartmouth and Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. Next, we've got Daniela Diaz. She covers Capitol Hill for CNN and has had her career mostly covering politics, including former Vice President Mike Pence and Senator Elizabeth Warren's presidential campaign. Daniela has also worked for Politico, NBC News, and the San Antonio Express. She is a proud Texan and a graduate of the University of Texas. And then last and certainly not least, Sabrina Rodriguez. Sabrina covers voters and, changing Amer and the changing American electorate at the Washington Post. Uh, I think she just joined the Washington Post last month and before that worked at Politico where she covered multiple beats, including the White House and a focus on Latino voters, Latinos in politics and immigration. And Sabrina went to Northwestern University. So I just sort of wanted to start off with the same question for all of you, which is how did you start out being a journalist? I mean, why did you, why did each of you even want to become a journalist? So we've got an audience of would be journalists, would be journalists, and people who are just fascinated by this conversation. So, Dax, tell me how you got your start in journalism. Well, my star, 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 I think we've got some sort of weird audio glitch. Do you want to try again? Star, 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 star. Well, that's interesting. Maybe let's start with somebody else um, and see if we can sort that out. Um, Daniela, why don't you why don't you tell me how you got your start in journalism? Is it is this working for me? Yes, it is. Okay, okay. Um, okay, cool. It sounded like you were stuttering. That's uh, I, Dax. Just wanted to let you know. Um, at least that's what it sounded like for me. Um, yeah, so I have been a journalist. I joined, um, I graduated college in 2014. I graduated, I just wanna uh, correct you, Susan. I actually did not go to UT Austin. I went to UT uh, Pan American, which is also known now as UT Rio Grande Valley. I'm from the border of McAllen, Texas. Um, very different schools. It's a sister school to UT Austin, but um, Longhorns would be very upset if I claimed that I graduated from there. Uh, well, thank yeah. You. I appreciate that correction. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, but I just want to go really quickly. I've had a lot of jobs in journalism. My background's print journalism. I worked at two newspapers, uh, one full time while I was in college called The Monitor. It's a daily newspaper. Star, 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 that he goes off of mute. Um, so I'm sorry, Daniela, please continue. Oh, no, I hope that gets solved. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, my background's newspapers. And so I, in, and I worked full time at a newspaper with like a circulation of 150,000. It's called the Monitor Daily Newspaper in McAllen, Texas. 
um, while I was in college. I almost quit college because I was like, why would I graduate? I'm working already as a print reporter, but I graduated. Um, and then I interned at NBC News uh, uh, my last semester of college, and I worked at Politico as a web producer. And then while I was at Politico as a web producer when I was 22, um, CNN was redoing its whole political unit in 2014 to prep for the 2016 election. And they hired basically like half the newsroom at Politico, um, including my boss at Politico, uh, Diana Heights. And then she brought me with her. So then I was a web producer and follow, just stay with me. I've had a lot of jobs. I was a web producer at CNN. Then I, and this is all for CNN.com. CNN.com and TV are very, very different at CNN. Um, very, I mean, they work together very closely, but different departments, different bosses, different budgets. Um, so for CNN.com, I was a web producer. Then I was a breaking news reporter. Then I covered Capitol Hill as a digital reporter. Then I made the switch in 2018, beginning of 2018, to become a campaign embed. And that's where I made the switch from, t from di digital to TV. And I was a campaign producer covering the 20, uh, 2020 election as an embed. Um, there's a documentary uh, that shows my entire life. If you guys want to watch it, it's called On the Trail. It's on HBO Max. They followed us for a few months and uh, you can really see what the job entails. It's one of the best jobs slash worst jobs you could ever have in journalism. And so I covered Elizabeth Warren during that time. The pandemic hit right when she dropped out of the campaign um, in March 3rd, March 5th, I think is when she dropped out. It's all fuzzy now. I've blocked a lot of it out of my head. It was like, there's some PTSD about how much I was traveling. Sabrina's probably getting a hint of it now because she's covering midterms, but you basically live your life on the road. Uh, you cover these campaign rallies. You barely have time for yourself. I was full-time traveling for two and a half years. So I got my apartment. I lived in hotels. Um, I was covering Elizabeth Warren. I covered basically every presidential candidate, but at the end it was Elizabeth Warren that I was focused on. Then um, I covered Mike Pence in the general at the height of COVID. Uh, Republicans kept campaigning if, before vaccines. And so I was covering Mike Pence, traveling on Air Force Two um, and during he, when he did campaign rallies. And then now I cover Congress, but for the TV side. So I'm back to covering Congress, but now I'm on TV versus... Uh, doing digital, which I still write for digital all the time. It's just a little bit of a, a more of a hybrid job because I do TV sh uh, live shots now early morning and weekends. Um, so yeah, oh. really crazy because I never in a million years thought I would be a TV reporter when I wanted to be a print reporter. But okay, but here we are. What I, want, what I really, really wanted to know, and that is an amazing journey. Oh, story. I'm so sorry if I misunderstood so, your question. No, no, no. It's you have been so busy. Um, but why did you want to become a journalist? I mean, what about this interested you as a career? It was funny. I never knew a journalist growing up. I never, that was not something in my community that I was around. A lot of the journalists that worked at my local paper came from journalism schools like Ohio State or Northwestern or Mizzou, and they predominantly were white journalists that they would come cover the Valley, cover the Rio Grande Valley for a year or two to get a bunch of bylines so they could move on to like very impressive newspapers. So I didn't know anyone locally that was a journalist. I fell into it because I realized that I love talking to people and I love telling people stories and I didn't realize that could be a career. Um, I was naturally a very people person and I really cared. I was always a news junkie too. Like I always watched the news, always read my newspapers. It was, it was like, there was such a disconnect. My dad worked in Maquiladoras, which is like a, a word that means he built things and cabinets growing up like no one in my family you know I'm like one I'm the second generation of my family to go to college my dad was the first like there's like no connection to journalism in my family I was so far from it even when I was telling my parents that I wanted to be journalists they were so confused they were like you could do that like you can make I what like there was no support from them in that sense uh because they they were so far from anything but I just kind of made it happen because I just knew that um, I really, I started working also another part of it is like, I was like, oh, my high school has a digital newspaper, my caught. And then when I went to college, I worked for a weekly newspaper. And then I started doing it and realizing I loved it and talking to people and interviewing people. And I was like, oh, this is something I could do. Um, I hustled a lot though, to be able to get to where oh. I am. Cause I didn't have any connections. I didn't have oh. anyone helping me. So I really put myself out there and kind of embarrassed myself a few times, but well. yeah. Hey, I'm sure every each one of us can tell our embarrassing stories, and maybe we will get to that. But Dax, let's see if you could tell us why you wanted to become a journalist. What was it? Was I mean, did did that story we've just heard from Daniela ring any chimes for you? Don't hear you. Our all right, let's work on that, um, Sabrina. Let me ask you. So, what was what was it about journalism that got you interested? 
Yeah, I mean, for me, it was very much, it, I did not have anyone around me, same as Daniela, where I could say, oh, I had a family member or close family friend or anything like that. I didn't grow up in a house that like received the newspaper every day or I don't have, like I meet journalists all the time that will tell the story of like, and when I was six, I was reading, you know, the Washington Post next to my dad. And I, I don't have that kind of story, but um, I did know I wanted to be a journalist from a really young age. Um, I, it's, it's a combination, I would say, of luck and of amazing mentorship um, where I lucked out and I remember my middle school had a school newspaper and I, I did it as an elective in school and I loved it. And then my high school had it as well and I did it. Um, and again, just a series of things that worked out that way where I heard of an amazing summer program at the University of Miami um, and did that. And then I heard that you could do a high school journal, a high school journalism um, internship at the Miami Herald. And I did that. And then at that point, it was like, OK, <laughs> like we know we all know what I want to do. Um, and and while my family didn't fully really understand what it meant to them, it was like, well, you're going to college. So great. Um, but, but kind of knowing what the intricacies of the job were, I don't think, um, most people in my community or my family necessarily understood, but, but yeah, but I think it was something that I was passionate about because I love talking to people. I love to, again, I'm like repeating what Daniela said, but, but love having those conversations with people. Um, and then I think the final thing for me was the politics piece of it. Um, and my family loves politics, <laughs> like my abuela listens to CNN all day. Like my abuela is a fan of Daniela's, like knows her from seeing her on TV. Um, and, and my abuela kind of instilled that in me of, of being up to date with the news, of being up to date on what's happening on politics. Um, and, and for me, it was like, I never want to be in politics. That sounds horrible. But the idea of writing it about it, that's fantastic. So it's kind of been a dream to, to be in DC and have the opportunities I've had. Okay, fantastic. All right, Dax, I see we've changed. Um, we've changed technology. Let's see how this works. Does my phone do a better job than my laptop? Yes, yes, yeah. fantastic. Of course. So <laughs> uh, all right, I'll be brief since I've already eaten into my time with this tech stuff. Um, my uh, interest in, in journalism stems from watching television and being fascinated with uh, all the pomp and circumstance of the age of Brokaw, Jennings, and Rather. Um, and I had wanted to get into student journalism in high school and I never got around to it. And when I went to school at Dartmouth, I said, I really wanna check this off my box. So I went and I became a reporter at the daily newspaper there and I loved it. And by the end of my time at Dartmouth, I uh, became the publisher of the paper and near the end of my run, um, I felt like I loved it a little bit more than was normal. And uh, I was off to go be a banker or a lawyer because that's what everybody was doing just before the financial collapse with Lehman Brothers. Um, and I got a chance invitation to, or a pitch rather, from uh, Robert Hager of NBC News, who was the old transportation correspondent. And he was an alum and he wanted to pitch a story. And I told him uh, that I was off to be a, a, a banker. And he said, but you know so much about TV. What, uh, what why don't you think? think about coming and, and uh, uh, becoming a, 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 an NBC News person. And I said, well, you know, I don't want to go from market to market uh, uh, doing, you know, the small local news. I'd, I'd prefer to, to really focus on politics and, and things of that nature. And he said, well, you could go to 30 Rock right off the bat and be a producer. And I responded and I said, what's a producer? My entire exposure uh, to media at that point had been as a print reporter or just as an observer on television. Um, and what I came to learn is that the different formats, television, digital media, now social media, print, uh, all have different ways of contributing to the collective body of what is the first draft of history. Um, and so, you know, now I make a profession out of it at ABC News here in Washington, um, but I feel like it's a privilege. And for me, um, it is the way that I kind of exercise uh, my belief in the First Amendment uh, and just kind of hearkening on those kind of more personal levels and cultural things as somebody who understands the immigrant experience by virtue of, of uh, my Miami Cuban side, uh, that resonates with me. And that's why when we go on the air every Sunday morning and we're talking about really, really consequential, is uh, consequential issues, which now are more consequential than ever, I think, um, it, it's, it's the way that I think that we can give back to society. And everybody does it in different ways, but journalists 
are playing an increasingly critical role because of the fact that um, truth is under assault. And we'll talk more about that, I suspect, um, but it's, uh, it's vital. So I'll leave it at that. I hope I answered in between jumping oh. in and out of this session. No, it's all good. You know, I do want to talk about trust in journalism. And, you know, here we are pretty much on the eve of the midterms, you know, just a, just a few weeks from now. And, you know, we are seeing so much mistrust in, in media generally, and we're seeing the propagation of a lot of falsehoods. And this has become a real problem for our profession. But what can we as journalists do to try to restore trust in media, in journalism, in, in the news that, in the fact-based news that we're trying to bring to people. I mean, what, how do you all handle that in your day-to-day -day jobs? Anybody can answer. I mean, I can, I can jump in. Um, it's actually been something that's very much on my mind because as with my new job being focused on voters, I'm spending a lot of time on the ground talking to voters. Um, mm -hmm. And, and this is, again, really relevant to me because just yesterday um, I was in Georgia and went to a Herschel Walker um, event. Um, and for those who do not know him, they're tuned in. He's running. He's like a Republican candidate for Senate. And there's been all these allegations around um, him having paid for an ex-girlfriend to have an abortion. And he's extremely anti-abortion, um, supports a, a national ban. So there's been a lot of attention around him and a lot of headlines around him in recent days. Um, and there's lots of questions about his fitness for office and, and such, but, but going to the event, I mean, he's a huge Trump supporter. Um, he, you know, has like very strong, like very, um, I would say more far right Republican support. So going to that event, I was already that fear or not fear, but that like anxiety of, uh, are people going to want to talk to me? And part of the story I was working on really hinged on having conversations with people and, and in not just being like, I'm there listening to what he says or what people are saying, but, but actually having conversations with voters. And I was surprised by the reception. I was surprised a lot of people were willing to talk, but what was key to me, I think, to, to be able to unlock, you know, genuine lengthy conversations was sort of like me walking them through the process. And then, you know, some of them started the conversations being like the fake news media or like, oh, like you work for the Washington Post. Who knows what you're going to do with what I'm going to say? Like, why should I trust you? Um, and, and people made comments like that. And it was answering those things. It was actually engaging with that. Um, and, and again, it wasn't in a situation where I didn't feel safe or anything like that. So it was like them just making a comment and like rolling their eyes and me being like, look, I understand that, that there's a concern where you don't really know where this is going to be published. So I'll tell you, I'm working on this story about this event and, and getting a sense of how people are feeling, especially because of the allegations, walking them through it. And, and kind of that process, because so many people don't understand what goes into the job that we do. Um, I think people think, oh yeah, they just put a headline, they say whatever they want to say. Well, for me to be able to talk about how voters that support Herschel Walker feel about him, I have to talk to voters that support him. <laughs> and, and I kind of explained that too, where, you know, the more people I get to talk to here, the better it is for my understanding of what's going on. If I only, if I leave here having only talked to a couple of people and then write a story based off of that, that story is not going to be nearly as rich. And frankly, not nearly as accurate as if I talk to many people. So I think too, like part of it, and that doesn't apply for every story, obviously, but, but for some things, it's like us walking readers through it, us wa walking people through it and, and being really transparent about what goes into our job so that they understand that I'm not just saying this because I think this, I'm saying this because I reported this out. Yeah, Danielle, how do you handle this issue? Well, Susan, for me, it's I mean, it's been complicated, right? Like I've had a lot of jobs where I've had to do different things. You know, I went from covering a Democrat where I would go to these rallies at covering Elizabeth Warren, who a lot of her supporters generally watch CNN um, and felt very welcome in these, a lot of these arenas that I would walk into talking to voters to covering Mike Pence in the height of COVID when everyone was hating CNN because of our coverage of, uh, you know, st social distancing and wearing your mask. And, you know, we would... What, you know, I'm thinking fall 2020, like really when we were in it. Um, and I had to talk to voters just like Sarina did. Like I had to be, and I, and I would come up to voters in mask, in a mask, which was tough because 
I wasn't vaccinated. I was at these rallies. They're usually outside, not always. And our protocol was to protect ourselves. So I wore a mask and always uh, voters sometimes were not comfortable with me talking to me because they would just assume something about me. But it was exactly as Sabrina said, is you have to meet voters where they are. And I also feel like establishing a rapport with them before you kind of start, start bombarding them with questions is really important. Um, really telling them who I am and where I'm from and uh, just saying, hey, I just really uh, would love to talk to you. I think it's really important for us to have your voice uh, in any piece that we're working on. Uh, I totally respect if that's not where you, what you want to do, but you're here. So I assume that you're opinionated about this and I would love to include your perspective in what, what I'm reporting. And I always would, I kind of had like a essay or not essay, but like a statement that I would had memorized that I would start with to kind of just like go before. And I would be, I will be honest with you, Susan, mostly I would be rejected. And I'm sure Sabrina what? was rejected a lot too. And well, you just have to keep going. Yeah, well, what it's, was it's tough. What was, what was it that you would say? What was that statement? So it's been a while since I've yeah. been on, Congress is different. Republicans, I have a lot of sources that I've established a rapport with a lot of Republican members. Sure. So that's different, right? But when I would be on the field, I'd be like, hi, I'm Daniela Diaz. You know, I'm with CNN. We, we're traveling on Air Force Two. They always were very, I feel like voters were very impressed that we traveled with the vice president. So it meant like there was a trust there that we were allowed because that's normally how we'd get to these campaign events because uh, I was pool. We would only do pool for these campaign events because it was like they didn't want, they wanted to minimize how many people. Uh, also for the students that are watching pool means um, it's, it's kind of complicated. So when you cover the White House or uh, sometimes at the height of the campaign season when you're the nominee for a party, uh, all the networks collaborate on just having one person for all the networks represent all the networks on the plane to minimize how many people, how many cameras, how many reporters are traveling with that candidate slash the president or vice president. So I would go cover Mike Pence as the pool representative for all the networks. Uh, there's also print pool, radio pool. Um, so it'd be a couple of us anyway. So I would tell like I, I travel in force two with the vice president. I really would love to hear what you're thinking about how the administration has handled COVID. You know, those were a lot of the questions I was asking at the time, mm -hmm. or like what you think about, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, Kamala Harris is who Biden chose this as running. I'm trying to remember some of the questions. It's been like two years. Um, two years? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, two um, years. Two years. Uh, wow, time flies. And so I, and then I'd always uh, just, you know, I think I also, okay, not to, you know, assume anything about people seeing me, but I'm small. And I have a really big smile, although it was hidden by the mask, but I was always coming toward people very kindly and with a lot of respect. And I think that that's really important in our jobs because that's all people want. That's all I want. That's what people who are talking to want. They want to be respected. They want to be treated kindly. And that's how I would try. Although I would say there were times that people would be very aggressive toward me and I just walked away. So it, it was tough. I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories, Susan, even, you know, in the 2018 midterms, I got spit on by a uh, uh, Republican, like and the, the, his spit did not land on me, but it was near me. And it was at uh, uh, Versailles in uh, Miami, Sabrina, if you can believe it. Yes, it was. Um, yeah, at a Ron DeSantis event when he was campaigning. It was. Yes, it was. So it was because he saw that I was CNN. It, it's just, you're gonna, you're, it just, you don't know, you just have to protect yourself. But I think that kindness is always goes far. Like I, you know, I'm just piggyback picky back off I'm sorry I'm like stuttering uh what Sabrina said um it just I just found that kindness goes really far but again it's hard it's really hard and I there's no like I don't succeed 100% I would I mean I doubt Sabrina had even got some I can't even imagine what it was like for her at the Herschel Walker event it's been a long time since I've been in the campaign or in the rallies I now cover Congress and I deal with my own roadblocks with Republican members maybe some that you know uh objective objected to the election results you know that's a whole other thing that we can get into but that's like what i'm dealing with now all right well so dax how are we going to turn around this whole trust in media issue or do you think that that's not possible i mean i understand how you can talk to individuals and get them to open up but sort of more big picture how do we change where we are well, I think everything uh, that Sabrina and Daniela have said is absolutely true. And it, it, in, in our uh, shop, uh, those things are, are very um, top of mind and, and we're working on them at ABC. What I would say is I think about the collective media as, you know, we compete against one another. But the way that I look at things when I look at other networks doing things is... Uh, 
one one bad apple that uh, does the gotcha that lacks the balance uh, that that kind of breaks the rules, if you will, uh, if you are a straight news outlet and cuts corners, uh, ruins things for everybody. And so I think that what I've tried to do in my own mindset and, you know, and as you know, Susan, in Washington, you, know, you talk about pools, Daniela. Yes, there's a collaboration to be able to cover all the news. I think we're always going to be competitors. We're owned by for profit companies. But I think that us making sure that we realize that to the consumer, to the end user, there is the media and they can interpret that one of two ways that there is a trust factor there or there is more evidence to suggest that they're out for the wrong reasons. I think that us thinking through the consequence of, of our actions in a hyper-polarized time in, in not the sense of our own reputations for our own shops, but for our craft, I think that's a, a different way of thinking. And I think that that can, can make some progress. I'm an optimist. I do think that the, if you study the arc of history, there are times that have frankly been more polarized, at least many would argue. And I, I'd like to think that this moment will evolve into a, a, a balance that will be uh, less cutthroat than it is now, not cutthroat competitively, but cutthroat in terms of, of everybody jumping down each other's throats. But I do think that there is a power of us all realizing that if we, if we don't stay the course of being uh, straight to the truth and straight with the audience, uh, which is in part going out and talking to people, but also in the way we present our line of inquiry to Democrats and Republicans and independents and people on the right or left of either party, um, that's to me fundamentally important. And I'm not sure that's the way that historically this town has operated, frankly, because I don't think you need it to. I think now, um, it's more important than ever because there's such a um, there's such a fracture in the media uh, in terms of different outlets for which to get your news and the hyper partisan uh, stuff that's out there, uh, which we don't I don't need to get into. But we are stronger when we are aligned in our values and collectively when we go to the audience with products of integrity. Uh, and everybody on this panel works for, for outlets that are of the greatest integrity. And it is incumbent on all of us to, to keep that reputation alive amongst the audience because uh, the consequences otherwise are, are dire. So, I mean, this raises an interesting point. So when I was coming up in journalism, um, a lot older than any of you, but, but the notion was to try to be totally objective, right? To really be impartial, to cover stories fairly and impartially and objectively. You know, lately, I think maybe among, there's some generational differences that are showing themselves in terms of the very word objectivity and whether objectivity is possible and whether it is, um, and, and whether it should even be a value. I guess, let me, let me ask you all, what do you think about that notion? Do you, do you think about that? Do you come up against that? Do you debate that with yourself? Absolutely. Um, I mean, I think for me, um, something that's frustrating, it is frustrating to me, like who defines what is objective, um, because there are topics as a Latina that get assumed that I can't be objective about, or it's, uh, oh, well, she's going to be, she's going to be sympathetic towards immigrants, or she's going to be writing about Latinos in a certain way, or she's going to have a more activist agenda, um, and, and things like that. And, and that has been a frustration because I am here to do my job the same way everyone else is here to do their job. Um, and I'm going to try and be, I, I don't think the goal is this unbiased, that I am an unbiased human. I have opinions about a lot of things and I have opinions about things that I have written about. But when I have those opinions, I am aware of them. So when I'm doing my job, I am going the extra mile to ensure that I am covering it fully. Um, and I actually, and, and again, I think that some of the issues that I probably feel the most passionate about are the ones that I have treated with the most care where I'm saying, okay, I have an opinion about this and I probably disagree with this person. I really need that person in my story. I really need to reach out to that person um, and, and talk to them and, and make sure I have that voice. And did I cover all my bases and okay, wait, let me make sure that I'm like, not sipping the Kool-Aid here on, on some issue, or I'm not sipping the Kool-Aid on what someone said to me um, or, or any of that. But I think we all have to operate from a place that 
we are people with opinions. <laughs> like I think this idea it, that, that I feel was like taught in journalism school and stuff of we're all so you're supposed to be unbiased. Well, I'm a human being I, that that is just natural. So I think if we operate from that place, we're going to do better work because we can like check ourselves in the process. So one of your pieces of advice to yourself as well as to the, the journalists watching would be know, know yourself well enough to know where you could, you could endanger the fairness of your story because of your own biases. Yeah. And there's store and, 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 and yeah, and there's stories where I know I have an opinion, but it's not one that that's not going to impact the story. So it's fine. And then, and I haven't run into this actually, but, but I would like to believe that if there's a story that I feel that I cannot do justice to, that I would say, I, you know, this is, this is too personal for me. This is not something I feel comfortable with. I think that that would, I mean, I, I think that would be potentially the best way to approach it. And, and thankfully I haven't found myself in that situation. But yeah. Well, but that, that's interesting. Daniela, how do you confront this issue? Uh, it's exactly what Sabrina said. I, it's, it's complicated, right? So like, I think what I bring to the table is my background. Like I'm different than every person that's in the room. And so I always use that as a strength. Like my parents are Mexican immigrants. I grew up on the border. I didn't go to a fancy school. I worked full time during college, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like I have a more, if you want to, if we want to be honest, like probably real life than some of the journalists that I work with who come from very privileged backgrounds as, and we're trying to cover real Americans, right? Like we want to cover people that are truly affected by the issues like inflation and the economy and immigration and, you know, the things that are affecting COVID, the things that are affecting uh, labor. I can keep going on and on like those things, like my background, I bring to that table in what I'm covering, but it's also, as Sabrina said in that, I also try not to let what I'm covering get in the way of like a, like an agenda, like have an agenda, like, oh no, I'm going to write this pro immigration story because my parents were immigrants. Like I know, like I fully try to cover both sides of an issue. I true. And the thing is for me, it's really easy because there's Republicans and then there's Democrats and then there's factions in both parties. So I try to really have that perspective on everything. And then as, as a congressional reporter specifically, obviously it's different when you're on the campaign covering candidates, but uh, it's, it's, when a Democrat releases a bill, you want the response about whether Republicans are going to support it. You know, it's very black and white covering policy on Capitol Hill in that sense. Uh, when you start talking to voters, obviously, it's a little different. You can pick and choose what voices you want. But for me, it's very what I cover is very day to day what policy is on, on Capitol Hill. So um, I really try to be as unbiased in that sense as possible. Dep I mean, you could talk to reporters from digital publications and they'll, they'll tell you that there's no such thing as being an objective reporter anymore. I disagree. I think that you can cover things fairly. Uh, and I think you can cover all sides. And I think you can be, and I also think you can call out things when they're wrong. Um, I am one of those reporters that believe that when something is racist, you should say it's racist. So that's another whole th thing that you can get into. But I also just believe in call, you know, being as objective as possible about these things when you cover policy um, but I, like I said, like, I mean, if there's one thing I could tell the students that are watching this, it's your background is what sets you apart in a room when you're interviewing with your, like your future boss, like your background and what you came up doing should be what you bring to the table. If you're bilingual, tell them you're bilingual. I'm bilingual. I speak perfect Spanish and I speak perfect English and I speak a little French and I own that. And I think that makes me so different than other people. And I think having parents that grew up you know, lower middle class makes me a really unique, gives me a really unique perspective on what's happening in America right now or growing up on the border when immigration is such a huge topic in these campaigns. So anyway, I could go on and on, but like, I do believe that you have to try to cover. And I think Sabrina's per one comment about there will be someone that you don't agree with, maybe personally, you want their voice in your story because there are people that do agree with that person. And also uh, we cannot speak, I cannot speak highly enough of having editors who, especially editors that care about you and review your work and will tell you, um, I think we need another voice in here. Or, um, I think we need to change the idea. Like having eyes on your work is so, so important and having other perspectives too. And that's why diversity is so important in the newsroom because you need all those different eyes uh, to really provide all perspectives. Well, exactly. And, and thank you for that shout out to editors <laughs> um, because all of us, I think, and the more experience you have, the more you realize how much editors have saved your butt along the way, right? No matter how good you are, or 
how much you might know. Editors have saved all of us. But Dex, let me ask you about something that Sabrina mentioned, which was sort of getting put in a box a little bit, right? That, <clears throat> that do, has that happened to you that people say, oh, you know, you're gonna come at something with an agenda because of, of your background. Um, do, has, have you dealt with that? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, I probably dealt with it when I, uh, before I joined ABC, I was working with Jorge Ramos at uh, Fusion, which was mm -hmm. the kind of short-lived experiment that was a venture between Univision and ABC uh, that was designed to go after Latino millennial audiences. And Jorge, um, obviously is a, a leader in, in the story of immigration and, and has brought that for decades to the Latino audience. And what we were trying to do was draw attention to it, uh, to an English language audience uh, on ABC, on, on digital platforms. And the biggest knock that we would get um, was that he was gonna come at it from one perspective. And as Daniela and Sabrina, I think have extremely articulately pointed out, uh, a familiarity with the topic because of your life experience doesn't deny you the ability to tell it objectively. And in those pieces and stories uh, that we did, uh, we spoke to both sides. Jorge and I then later did a documentary for HBO, which was about the rise of, 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 the, of the hate movement in America, which uh, was really ahead of its time. It was before the uh, 2020 election. Um, and I remember being at a cross a swastika burning with Jorge and being pointed at saying, uh, those guys have funny accents, uh, what's going on with them? And it was a, it was, it was a very scary experience. Um, and, uh, you know, on some stories, uh, you know, like, uh, like hate in the aftermath of Charlottesville or whatever, I'm not sure there's exactly two sides and I don't mean that as a political comment, but so my, 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 my perspective on this is, um, I have been in those situations. Uh, I think it's not so black and white and I do think that, that we've made a lot of strides in media uh, over the past several years of it being okay for someone with an experience to bring that experience to the story and the story can still maintain objectivity. It's, it's in many respects, it can be just as hard to muck up a straight news report by injecting a, a slant into it than to just lay the facts out whether or not you have a life experience that colors it. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've seen it in, in different stories in my career. Um, and I think that one of the things that the evolution of media in, in recent years, um, what we've made advances on is uh, that diverse perspective, I think has a greater acceptance among uh, the public and, and I think we're stronger as a journalistic community for allowing that because there used to be, as you know, Susan, just kind of these norms that someone was inherently biased if they were Latino about covering a certain issue. That is an extremely antiquated way of thinking as it would be that a black reporter couldn't cover George Floyd, right? That's ridiculous. Uh, and I think we've made a lot of progress there. And I think the body of work speaks for itself. Oh, well, I, I totally agree. You know, I've got a good, a really interesting question here from the from our audience and I want to ask it and then ask you to expand it a little bit, which this is specifically about the pandemic. And it says in your coverage during the pandemic, you know, what information did you unpack and how did it emotionally affect you? And how did you operate in the reporting process? You know, so let me expand that slightly. I mean, I know you've all had to cover really difficult things. I know, um, you know, People were at, you know, uh, at the Capitol on January 6th, right? That, that was a diffi really difficult moment. You've all covered really hard things. You talked about, you know, getting nearly spit on. You talked about covering issues where there are people who hate you because of who they are or who you are. Um, how do you deal with that emotionally? Any kind of tough issue that you come up against? Thoughts? Um, I can speak uh, to that. If that uh, so I was in the Capitol during January 6th. Um, I was on the House side. And that was really tough because I had to basically shut out my personal emotions and cover it. So that's what I did. Uh, I didn't really process what had happened. And, and I, you know, I'm okay. Like everything was fine. Like 
everyone has their own views about like what happened that day and what it meant. And, and I mean, if you ask me, I think it was a really important day and we should recognize it for what it was, which was an insurrection. And, you know, that's how my network covers it. And I think it's really important to recognize that. But I also, uh, I was safe. We evacuated. I covered, I covered the result, the certification of the election after it happened. I finished my job. I didn't leave the Capitol until 7 a.m. the next day. Uh, the city was locked down, so I couldn't get home. Those were like the things that you just, you have to deal with. But then it's funny, I was talking to my boss because I was complaining to my boss about uh, the fact that I couldn't get home. And I was just like, oh, I was like stuck at the Capitol for 24 hours. straight. I got there the 9 a.m. on that Wednesday and didn't leave until 7 a.m. on Thursday and like fully awake 24 hours. Um, and he reminded me that he covered a war. And, and I forgot what he had mentioned, but he was like, oh, one time I was stuck like in the middle of a bomb. Like it just, that's our job, right? Like this is like, I can complain to him because he's like, I've been there, done that. Like you but were just the capital, you were DC. Like, I think, I think we have to, car okay, this is like probably not the best thing, but I car compartmentalize a lot. <laughs> like, uh, so another thing is like, I had a lot of, you know, I, I was traveling when people were being told to stay home. I was on airplanes, like going to campaign rallies and talking to voters. So it's like, that was, I mean, obviously my company checked with my comfort level and to see that I could do something like that. But I remember, you know, in August, 2020, when I was traveling pretty much full time again, everyone was like, you are like, I haven't left my house in two months. Like, and this was way before the vaccine came out, what next spring, like that, you know, this is like my reality. And I think that not, you know, it's not for everyone. I think that that's what I'm trying to say. This job is not for everyone. And I think that you have to understand that if you really need to cover the story, you need to be in it. And you have to be okay with being uncomfortable and being, you know, in the middle of it and in the danger. And, you know, I could have, I, I didn't get COVID. I was really cautious. I double masked and I was really lucky to have access to PPE when there was no PPE, you know, I, you know, took really good caution. And then the, during the interaction, I fall, I followed the police. There were people that were not following what the police were saying to do. I did because I didn't want to be in the middle of it. I was also a lot of the people that if you go back to the coverage were men in the middle of it. I was a little girl and I like, I'm tiny. So I was like, I'm not going to go in the middle of the hallway. And as a CNN reporter, when they were shouting, they wanted to attack CNN reporters. I was like, I'm not going to do that. Um, but I mean, I was there and I covered the aftermath and I, I have a video of like, you know, the trashing the Capitol and all that. So I don't, I think there's a certain, I think you have to be okay with that. I think you have to be okay with being uncomfortable. And of course, uh, my network, I want to make very clear has always checked you know, to make sure that I'm okay. And I think that's also really important too, to make sure you work for a company that will always check to make sure you are not, you're comfortable with what you're doing. Like when I started traveling again, I told them I want, I was okay with traveling again. Okay. So, so that's a whole other part too. So one of the, so two of the things I'm hearing you saying is, is you've got to be okay with being uncomfortable and, you know, you compartmentalize a little bit. I don't know, Sabrina, how are you dealing with some of these sort of tough emotional moments? I mean, I co-sign everything that Daniela says. I have not been in either level of situation as, as she has been. So I will say that. I think that's like a being there for January 6th is a whole unique experience in itself. But but I think just, just speaking to, because so many of the people that are listening, if they're going to be journalists, are going to run into just emotionally taxing situations. Um, I remember the first time I was sent um, to South Texas. And actually, Daniela mentioned, like she recommended food when I was down there and everything. But, but that trip, I mean, was, was draining to, to have conversations with migrants that, that had made weeks journeys to come to the border and, and talk to them and, and to even navigate the ethics of that to navigate, like you just finished crossing a border. And now I'm here trying to get you to tell me your story. And all of that was, was complicated and, and emotionally draining. And, and I even feel selfish saying that it was emotionally draining because it's nothing compared to, to what was going on. Um, but, but just like coming home from that, I think a lot of people will find themselves in situations, whether they're covering immigration, whether it's January 6th, whether it's COVID, there, there will always be something happening. And it is building a community. <laughs> the number one thing uh. that I will say that is advice is building a strong community, whether there, I, I have a lot of friends that are journalists um, that not everyone does that. Some people kind of are like, I want my work to be my work. And then I will have my friends outside of that. I am very close friends with a lot of people that, that are journalists as well. Um, and, and that has helped me so much because I am able to come to people that know what it is to be 
to be emotionally exhausted, to know what it is that like you love the job, but you hate the job that day <laughs> or, or, you know, or, or, oh, I've been on the road all these days. And like, I just, like, to, I, I just flew back today from, from Georgia and came to the office and I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about the stories that I'm working on, but I've been in a hotel for five days and will be in a hotel in two days again. Um, and, and having people that have had that experience is so nice because they can understand what I'm saying. I'm loving it, but I'm so tired. So finding, finding your community to talk to. So let me ask you, Dex, how you get through those tough emotional times when that guy comes up to you and, and you know, is hateful to you. Um, I, I've had stories where I had a little PTSD after the fact. I, I, I think you put yourself in a zone and you know that the job uh, of being uh, as a, you know, being an objective journalist comes first. And that's just the, the very simple answer to your question. I, I want to piggyback on something as an EP of a show. My normal place when we're executing our, our broadcast would be in the control room. Uh, but every once in a while, um, I make it a point to say, no, I am going to go out into the field to see this with my own eyes, because it is gonna help me be, you talked about editing before, help me understand ways to tell the story of the pandemic, help me tell the story of gun violence in America. Um, so I, I think it actually is, is fundamentally important that all, all manner of people get out there to see it for themselves because the worst thing we can be is in a Washington bubble or a New York headquarters bubble, that's actually bad. Um, and yes, we have to look out for each other and our, our, we work for great companies that do that. Um, um, but, you know, I can remember many a story where I came back and I needed a moment to kind of process what I saw. But my, my story is simple. When I'm out there, I'm kind of on this adrenaline rush of, you know, you've got deadlines, you've got an obligation to tell the story. And in my experience, what I go through covering generally somebody else's tragedy, it pales in comparison. Uh, so when I was out in Arizona for Gabby Giffords shooting all those years ago, uh, you know, I couldn't even think about myself because there was a much worse situation. Uh, you talk about the January 6th, you talk about those who lost their lives or were injured, those Capitol police. So that's the perspective that I take with me. Um, yeah. uh, but it's the perspective is what grounds you to do the job and make sure that you don't make yourself part of the story. Um, but we're all humans and we all have to have that, uh, that check up after. And, uh, the community is important that Sabrina talks about. All right, we are almost out of time. So I just wanna ask one last question and I've got, I've got one here from the audience and it really talks about advice to students, right? So, but I'd also like to piggyback on that a little bit. So your advice to students who wanna be journalists, but also what would your advice be to your younger self, right? When, when you were that student, maybe it's the same advice and maybe it's not. But Daniela, let's start with you and we'll just go around. You know, Susan, it's really funny. I, I think of my younger self for perspective of about to turn uh, 31. And, um, and uh, when I was 22, I was probably the most insecure person ever. And I think of, and, and, and it was even worse when I was like 21, 9, 20, 19, because I didn't, didn't know that I could do this because I didn't think I was good enough. And I think that I just would love to tell all the students watching this is that you are good enough, probably smarter than some of my bosses. And I would love to see some of y'all as my bosses because that is the reality is any, anyone can do this. If you have the certain amount of, you have the, the drive and the passion, you can achieve whatever you want. Of course, you need to have that work ethic. Of course, you can't just walk into a room and be like, I can do this and not do the work. Um, I also have found that being um, incredibly humble goes a long way. Uh, and very gracious. So those are always, I, I feel like my personality and the way I've managed to get this far is because I've just had all those qualities. And I would recommend that all the students do that with anything they do, but also just understand that you guys should apply to everything. That's what I did. That's the only reason why I am where I am is like, no joke. I applied to uh, like 30 internships the summer before my senior year, 30. I just basically changed like two words in each cover letter and just kept resubmitting and resubmitting. And you know how many contacted me again? Two. So like, I have just learned that like really putting yourself out there goes a long way. The way I got one of my internships is I was working as a server at a college event and the publisher of my local daily newspaper, the monitor, the one I eventually worked at full time was there with his wife because his wife worked in the PR department of my university. And I went up to him in my server clothing and I said, I really would love to intern for you. 
And he said, I can't pay you. And I said, that's fine. I'll, as long as you're okay with me working like a full, like I worked at build a bear workshop in college. So like, uh, that's how I made, that's how I paid for gas in college and stuff. Um, so like he, he worked with my hours and we figured it out and eventually I did get paid pretty quickly, uh, by the monitor. So my point is I just really put myself out there. And I think that you just have to embarrass yourself sometimes and really put yourself out there and apply to everything and never think that something's too good for you. You're perfect for whatever you're applying. Now, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Just, I also am a huge uh, advocate for reaching out to places and being like, Hey, why didn't this work out? And they can ignore you. But I think asking you'd be surprised how many places respond and just say like, Hey, you just didn't have the skills for this, or maybe you need to work on this. Um, when I mentor students, I always recommend that. And it's surprising how many come back to me and be like, Oh, they responded. And they told me I didn't have, I didn't like it even happened recently where an, a, a girl I was mentoring applied for an internship at CNN and she didn't contact me soon enough. And then I had her and she never heard back. And then I had her reach out to CNN and be like, why didn't you? And I talked to the editor that she applied with. And turns out the editor didn't realize that she was going to be in DC that semester. So it's like little things end up happening and why you don't get opportunities. Anyway, my point is put yourself out there, be humble, be gracious, work hard. And you deserve every opportunity that comes your way. As long as of course you put the, the heart into it. And I heard you say, be persistent, write those 32 letters, right? And, and just, and don't be afraid to do that. And you might I would also say there, there is also a very fine line between persistence and annoying, okay. but I think it's really easy to tell when you're being persistent in a good way and then probably being ignored and then probably time to move on to your next person on your list to bug. Do you know what I mean? Oh. <laughs> I don't All know. Right. Like, yeah. that's my, my advice. Okay, excellent advice. Sabrina, tell us your advice to students and to your younger self. You're on mute though. To, <laughs> to students, um, I would say the number one, the number one thing I would say is look to each other for, for support, look to each other as peers and be kind to each other. Um, I think for me, at least in college, there was a big focus on um, oh my God, get coffees with people who could be your bosses and focus on like looking up to like mentors. And that is a very important part of the job for sure. An important part of, of when you're in college and when you're looking for a job and everything. But the amount of times that colleagues have come through for me um, in, in terms of finding out about job opportunities or just offering that support when I'm in the newsroom and I'm stuck on a story and I don't know, like, oh, like, I feel like, is the story going to suck or what should I do? Um, it's those colleagues that have really helped make that happen. So I think that's something important. My college, I feel like had like somewhat of a competitive environment and I wish it hadn't. I wish that it had been more like, we're all going to be fine. <laughs> like we're all going to succeed in this industry. There is actually, journalism is not dying. Like there's actually lots of jobs and opportunities. Um, so I think that's one thing. And to myself that I would offer as well is, and this is, and I will say the person who point, who said this to me was my friend and, and colleague, Eugene Daniels. And I don't know if he coined this, but I feel like I have to give him credit for it. And he said, you belong in every room you find yourself in. And I think that's really important. I think I, at the beginning of my career, had a lot of doubts about myself and, and was in rooms where like people did not have the same background as me and, and we just had very different experiences and I didn't speak up. Um, a lot of meetings that I was, that went by where I said nothing. Um, and, and I think, you know, no, like if you are, if you find yourself somewhere, it's because you belong there. There's no question about it. That's a, that's a great way to put it. You belong in every room you find yourself in. I'm going to remember that myself. All right, Dax, you are uh, the best person here. Uh, I would say, first off, uh, you, you know, you guys have a great program and leaning on the alumni network uh, as a way of not necessarily getting a job, but having the access to the information, the connections, the, the sounding board is something that I uh, used when I was an undergrad. Uh, and and try to pay back all the time when I get the when I get the call. So you you come from a a, a great alumni base and and you should definitely use that. Um, there's a joy that, that that those of us now on the receiving end have of being able to give that um, advice. Um, pursue what it is you want to do. Um, don't worry about things like the money or overthink things early on. That's, that was the mistake that I made at one point, And that was advice that was given to me. Once I started focusing on what it is that I actually wanted to do, that's where I actually found out what I was good at. The rest figures itself out. 
if you go in and complicate it by these kinds of, well, this person that I look up to went this way, so I've got to go this way. Don't, it's, keep it simple, stupid. Go with where your heart is for what you want to engage with professionally. The rewards will come because you will be invested in what you're doing. Anything else is, is, is going to lead you astray. And then the last thing I would say is, advice that uh, was given to me uh, as of late, because we're all still always thinking about that. Um, a boss uh, told me before I got this role uh, that part of the reason I was, was getting it is that I had kind of kept my head down and had done the work. And that there's often this, this feeling that the, the squeaky wheel gets it. That's not necessarily true. And I know as a manager that the people on my team who work the hardest and are the quietest, I know who they are. Uh, and, and, and that is a very valuable thing to be associated with reputationally. Um, so yes, you want to speak up for yourself. You want to seek opportunities. You want to be connected. You want to network. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, the pursuit of the work that you want to do and being known for the caliber of the work that you're doing, I think is probably the best advice you can continually reinforce for yourself as you are beginning your career. And frankly, until you reach the end of your career. Uh, so that's the advice uh, that is past and current for me that I would pass on. Well, gosh, uh, I, I feel inspired just by listening to the three of you and we have heard so much great advice. Thank you for you know, sharing your wisdom and your thoughts and your experiences with the Cronkite Nation and this Cronkite Live event. I really appreciate all of your time today. Um, thank you all so much. Daniela, were you about to say something? I was just going to thank you for moderating. You did an oh. amazing job and asked us the best questions. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all. Really appreciate your time tonight. Have a great evening and many thanks from Cronkite Nation. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.